Welcome back folks. After our last wild camp and looking at the Iron Age house, we explored the amazing Duncarloway Brock. After we left there, we headed for a tour round a Harris Tweed Mill. Join us to see how that went and later on we find another amazing wild camp. Welcome to the channel. We are Graham and Ellie. We are Wizard in the Wild. So we leave the Duncarloway Brock. Our route takes us from the Brock and we firstly head to the Carloway Mill. After that tour, it's just a short drive to the Garanon Black House village. There are only three Harris Tweed Mills on the island. We are visiting the smallest one, which is called Carloway Mill. We actually had difficulty finding this place, so I've put the what three words location to where we parked. Do have a look at their website under the visitor section. You can always book a tour by phone and the phone number's there on their website. They do have a small shop there which we looked around while waiting for the tour to start. Warning, they do some lovely stuff. This bear on the shelf now sits on my desk watching me edit. We'll send a sticker for the first person to guess his name. Right, Ellie's going to get this tour started. The majority of wool used for Harris Tweed is from Scotland and here you can see the raw fleeces as they arrive. These are then washed and once they've been washed they're put into big steel drums which are at a very precise temperature to dye the wool and each one will have a different colour in it. As you can see in here, I think it's a sort of a blue colour that they're dyeing and it gets very hot and steamy. All the wool has to be dyed before it's woven, hence the phrase dyed in the wool. And as you can see, there are some amazing colours. This chap here is called D.I. He was brilliant. He was our tour guide and explained everything to us. Although I can't profess to know, understanding everything he said, it was quite a complex process. In the background, you can actually see the chap taking the green wool out of what is a sort of a spin dryer stroke heated dryer. And what that does is it takes the dyed wool and dries it and spins it so it becomes all light and fluffy. As you can see, it's amazing stuff. It feels absolutely gorgeous. And there it is in the machine. There are loads and loads of different colours that are used. In the distance there you can actually see all the colours that are used for making the tweed and they are literally, they have to be done to a really precise recipe. This hole in the floor was really fascinating. Um, we were all asked to stand round it and uh, just watch basically. And what happens here is that the first mix for the tweed is created and it has to be put into this little hole and then it goes into a machine as you'll see in a minute. So today they were working on a mixture of white, black and navy blue and when the machine switched on it pulls the wall down. Obviously he's just shown us with a little bit, goes down through the pipes and into a machine that mixes it. I envy this lady, that looks such fun. But someone had to do it, didn't they? <laughs> we thought we'd never see her again. But uh, these walls are in the right proportions. They've been measured to have the right proportion of white, black and blue, which will make a kind of grey colour at the end. So all of that goes through the hole in the floor. Yeah, so this is the first mix. There's the machine just behind Graham. You can see that wheel spinning. That's where the wool went after it was fed through the hole in the floor. And you can just about see it to the left of the screen where the machine there is mixing it. So it's blending. It's its first stage of blending the wool to start to make it into one colour. I should mention that these fantastic old machines are actually Victorian. I think the mill 
uh, some of these machines date back to 1892 and they're still going today and there we go this is like a giant carding machine I don't know if any of you have ever done felting but basically that comb that you can see going across the top is mixing the wool this is the first mix so each little step is making this more and more into a, a one coloured type of fabric or wool the process continues with more and more stages I, I you know it takes quite a long time to actually get the finished wool ready for weaving but this machine here is doing more of the same if you look you can see to the left that's the wool that has had its first mix and it goes on to these giant carding rollers um, I don't know if that's their official name I don't know if you can see but um, these huge rollers are beginning to blend the white blue and black wool fleece into grey fabric it's almost looking like grey fabric now if you can see or felt I should say it doesn't look like fabric yet but it's a felty type material like a pale grey isn't it so all of these processes gradually merge those wools into one kind, one colour of wool. The noise levels in here are quite high actually, it was quite difficult to hear what DI was saying about the process. Um, so we'll probably let you hear a little bit but it was very very loud. But I do love seeing these old machines continuing to be used today. This mill is also not for profit, in fact. It's to support the industry of the islands. Now these beams have actually got the wool on them. They're like giant bobbins. If you can see, this is the very fragile new thread that's being created. And at this point, it's extremely weak. You wouldn't be able to weave anything with it, it would just break. You can see this chap as he pulls it off, he's sort of checking it and um, you'll see how easy it is to break. It's very fluffy, very soft, but not terribly practical. So it has to be spun and once this process has happened and the wool is twisted gently to make it stronger and stronger you can see it on the top here on the beam or roller and it's threaded through onto bobbins and the bobbins are here at the bottom and they spin round and round and fill up to the top and they get ready for, for weaving and as you can see the wool's looking more and more like wool now rather than sheep's fleece you can also see the colour so what started off with three colours is now a nice pale grey sometimes the threads actually break when they're being wound onto the bobbins and um, the chap here is actually just checking on them and repairing them when they break. It's got a lot to keep an eye on. And here you can see him fixing it. Does it so quickly? And away she goes. Graham looks totally engrossed by it all. So we're off now to another part of the factory. Um, and this is where the wool that is on the bobbins is prepared, ready to go out to the weavers. So on these giant rollers, I think they're called beams, 
you've got all the wool ready to go out to the looms out in the community. And this part is really technical. It was actually quite confusing. Um, I don't know if you can see, but they, the, the wool is in a particular stripe, which is the tweed, and that is ready to be added to the loom in that particular order. It's not random, that is the pattern. And the mill creates the wool in the right order for it to be threaded onto the loom. It's important to say at this point that the weaving is done out in the community. It isn't done here at the mill. And um, that's part of the Harris Tweed tradition and part of, of, of being able to give it its certification. You'll see one of the looms out in the community um, later on actually in a, a museum that we're going to visit. So you'll see what happens to the wool when it leaves here. But this machine actually creates the patterns and this is the really complicated bit so you've got all these various bobbin uh, sorry all these various cones of wool and um, they have to be threaded through in a very specific order as you can see here to create the warp threads as you can see like a spider's web isn't it you can see all these lines of wool and that is the pattern for the tweed yeah it's all about so counting. DI did try Three, to explain right? to me, yes. but I cannot say I could honestly do it. But he'd say, you have four of these, one of these, and eight of these, and two of those. And that then creates the pattern all the way along. One by six. One by six. One by Ready for the weavers. And you can see the tails on a beam over here. And there we go. And each of those tails that you see, the bits where there's like a little knot at the top, that is the end of that section or that part of the pattern and then it's repeated. So, once the wool has been woven, it is then returned to the mill for finishing. And this is how it comes back. Brilliant colours. Just like that, all wrapped up in a big bale. And it's very loose fibre and um, it needs more process before it's anywhere near ready to go out to the shops. The first thing that has to be done when the wool comes back from being woven is it has to be checked. And what DI is doing here is he's checking the fibres to see if there's any damage because sometimes you'll get a broken thread. And he checks it and then repairs everything if there's any faults in it. And this particular piece of fabric does have a fault in it. So he's about to do what Graham says I should be doing. And he's about to darn it. I think uh, Graham thinks I should be darning his socks. But as you can see, there's a broken thread. I start down there. I have to finish from there to there. And DI is about to repair it. I don't know if you can see, but it's on a light box. That's why you can see white shining through the fibres. You can also see how loose the fibres are still because it hasn't been finished yet. It's certainly great with a needle. Right? Yeah. And you... That's it. That's it. You can see it now. That's it. You can see it. Make that look easy. And there's an awful lot of washing to do. What happens now? Um, once it's repaired, the fibres have to be washed. So this is where the tweed gets washed. Um, DI told us that the temperature is, is kind of hand hot, I guess, about between 35 and 40 degrees. You wouldn't want to have it too hot because the wool would then shrink and it would become felt rather than um, tweed. So it all has to be washed. That does help to tighten the fibres, though. I think there's soap in there, too, as well as the warm water. Once the tweed has been washed, it then gets put round a series of rollers which actually help to tighten and also stretch the fabric to make it the right size. It's sort of compressed basically. And this is one of the machines that actually helps to get the fabric to the right size. 
it steams it and stretches it and you can just about see see some rollers there where the fabric is rolled between there's fabric on top of it so that you can't actually see the tweed but um, it goes through these series of rollers so that it can end up with the perfect density, the perfect width and the perfect weight and finally once all that has happened and it's been dried it, it gets its certification from Harris Tweed After our tour, we were invited upstairs <laughs> to uh, the ladies' glasses steamed up, and it was like a sauna. And this is where they keep all their scraps of wool and everything um, and clothes ready for the shop. And suffice it to say, I did weaken. And thank you so much, DI, because he gave me loads of scraps and loads of wool. Right, that's the tour of the mill over. Now, short drive up the road to Gorenin, to the Black Houses. We start our tour of Na Gerenin Black House Village in the Visitor Centre. The cluster of houses at Girenon were built in the late 1800s. For centuries, Highlanders and their livestock lived in these one-roomed houses. The houses then had packed earth floors, dry stone walls and thatched roofs, and they offered refuge from the wild North Atlantic weather. It's really hard to believe how they did it, but people actually lived here until the 1970s and the last original residents left in 1974. In fact, as a nod to the families who lived there, all of the various houses are named after the family name of the people who lived there originally. Once the last people had moved out, it seemed as though the village would be lost and it was going to crumble and decay. But in 1989, the local trust decided to set to work and restore and preserve these historic buildings. And in fact now, if you really want to, you can hire them um, as holiday accommodation. And what a fantastic experience that would be. Well, it's time to head inside to have a good look round. A lot of the items in the museum are in fact original from the time when people used to live here and it forms part of a living museum and it's fantastic that you can just go in and have a good look around and really feel as though you're part of that time. You can see the peat fire. It was actually really cosy and very sort of warm and inviting if a little smoky. We actually thought that these houses looked quite comfortable sort of houses you would need in this kind of environment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, how about, okay, I can go up to the bottom of Louis. Um, it looks quite cosy, doesn't it? Like yeah, it? it does, yeah. Oh, my mum had a sewing machine like that. Did she? Exactly like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I probably remember the case. The smell of the peat fire was wonderful. I remember these brand names from my nan's old house. The reason the houses were called black houses wasn't because they had small windows and lots of smoke in them, but it's because they were compared to new houses being built in the late 1800s. And these were called white houses. And the white houses were so designed to separate humans from their livestock and animals. Whereas in black houses, the animals lived with the people. The black houses at Gerenen are the best example of such houses on Lewis. And the design of these houses goes back several thousand years, as does the construction method. The buildings consist of two concentric dry stone walls with a gap between them filled with earth or peat. 
Sounds very much like um, insulation. The roof was, e was either thatched or made up of turfs and constructed on a wooden frame and the frame was supported by the inner wall which gave the characteristic look of a shelf around the outside of the building. As the roofing material had to withstand quite extreme weather conditions at times, the roofing material was often secured by using netting with large stones tied at the end. Not something you'd expect to see in one of these houses. And as promised earlier in the vlog, you can actually see an original loom here weaving the beautiful Harris Tweed that we saw being prepared at the mill earlier today. It has the most incredible sound. Kind of therapeutic. And what a fantastic location. The Black House Village is open from late March until the end of September. At the time of putting this vlog out, it's uh, £4.60 for an adult for entry to the, to the village and all the museums and everything. And rentals per night, if you want to stay here, start at £142 per night. So although it's quite expensive, it will be a fantastic and unique experience. Well, that's the fantastic uh, Black Houses done. Now we've got to go and find the Whalebone Arch. The Whalebone Arch is an amazing story. I suggest you freeze the screen so that you can read it. The, the item hanging down is the actual harpoon that killed the whale back in 1920. Right, that's the whale jawbone sorted out. Now we're going to head down to our wild camp. It's a bit further, Loch Eresort, quite a way down south. The sky was a real delight, as you'll see in these uh, clips. This was a great little park up, so I've put the what three words location up there. Here is a quick look from the drone. You wait till you see the sunrise in the morning. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at? Me saying oh. hello. Oh. Little jazz. Is that scary? Oh. <coughs> I think Jazz wants to be in on this oh. vlog. <laughs> You've had your dinner. Oh. She's uh, being a bit uh, temperamental today, is Jazz, isn't she? You're going to let us record this, are you? Or not? Jazz. Shh. Thank you. We've, we've had quite a good day today, haven't we? We've been yes, really busy. we have. It's been a busy day, really. Yeah, can you tell? We've both got red faces. And surprisingly, we had a lot of... Uh, well, initially we had a lot of rain, but then mm. we had a lot of good weather, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah. You'll have seen by now that we left Boster Beach this morning and that were the dogs. We had to literally, virtually wring Jazz out. She was so soaking wet. Yeah. But um, after that, the weather steadily improved it did, for the yeah. rest of the day. Not so good again now, but um, yeah, got up to some good things, which you'll have seen. So what do you think you like the most about today, Gray? What was the thing that you liked? Well, I liked most? the Brock. That was really good. And the, the, the fact that you could actually get inside it and, and walk around to your heart's content. That was really good. But I also liked the, um, uh, the mill as well. Mm. That was really good. Yeah. yeah. We had a guided tour. Um, which you probably picked up that was a guided tour on the on the video mm. and uh, he was really interesting wasn't he? He was, D.I. his name is. the D.I. yeah. The guy who manages or owns the it's mill. It's a strange name isn't it? Yeah and it's all made up of old equipment that's been sort of exported from Yorkshire 
to Scotland. So mm. hopefully you'll have seen quite a lot of that in the vlog anyway. Um, oh, and the black houses, I enjoyed those as well. Yeah, the museum was yeah. good, yeah. Oh, and the Iron Age house that we saw first thing. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, he liked everything we did today. I wasn't so keen on the whale bone, but that's because I didn't go and see it. You did, No, and that was really weird because you yeah. felt like you had to walk into someone's garden to do it, really. Oh. And if you can hear woofing in the background, it's jazz, and we're trying to kind of work with it because um this is about our fourth attempt to try and uh, jazz. talk about the day that we've had and i think jazz thinks it's all about her so, yeah and i don't think graham was very impressed with me when I, when we went to this mill because this is what i came out with it's a woolen mill and this is all rubbish basically there's loads and loads of wool. I think it's sacrilege that goes into landfill. No one wants it because it's flammable. Um, and it just gets thrown away. And, and, off, and tweed offcuts as well, because it's a tweed mill. We haven't explained that, but yeah. So that's what I've come away with. And we're in Merlin, aren't we? With limited storage on a long trip. The last thing we need is a blooming great ball of wool. Yeah, I tried to say to him, well, it's quite light. It won't, it won't add much weight to the van, but it certainly adds bulk. <laughs> so yeah, my tr my treasure from the day. Um, but yeah, we've had a great day. I'm just cooking dinner at the moment. I'll uh, show you that next, I think. Just fried of some mushrooms. And now I'm just cooking some pasta in the pie trick pot. And then I shall add some peas and a cheese sauce for our supper tonight. Yum, yum. Yum, yum. It looks a bit oily. It's because I've just fried the mushrooms in this pot. I'm all for one pot cooking. Keeps it simple. As you can see, I've already added this cheese sauce from Bosch. And I've also put in some nice chunks of vegan cheese. Well, this smells absolutely delicious. Although visually it leaves a bit to be desired. And it's macaroni cheese with a twist. It's got mushrooms and peas in it. And a big chunk of vegan cheese in it. So, uh, Mine's got real cheese. No. Yours oh, has got it? vegan cheese. Oh. Shame. So it's all vegan cheese. Yep, macaroni. I don't know how hot it is. Mmm. Very cheesy. Mm, just what you need. I suppose I better try it. Then. You better try it. Yeah, you quite like that cheese sauce. Watch this slick camera swap. Not. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's lovely. Mm. Comforting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, comforting. So even when we're in the Outer Hebrides, the editing still has to be done. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks for coming along with us as we continue to fall in love with these beautiful islands. Next time, see the famous Luskentire Beach, but we get news that could completely change our plans. Thank you for joining us this week. If you've enjoyed our vlogs, please do consider liking, subscribing and giving us the thumbs up. Oh, and don't forget to comment. We love to hear what you think of our vlogs. And join us next time for some more adventures with Wizard in the Wild.